Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged, engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived or so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Welcome to Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. I am Bjorn Skaptison, and this is Virtual Book Signing. Probably recognized those few appropriate remarks. Uh, this is our, we think of this as our Gettysburg Address sesquicentennial uh, commemorative show. Uh, the actual sesquicentennial was the 19th of November, and we were in Gettysburg for that, so we couldn't bring you a show on that day. We have two great authors here tonight. One of the books is more specifically about the Gettysburg Address than the other, but both of the books look at, uh, in, some, in some way, at Lincoln and his great words and his great world view, and how that, uh, in some ways, how the Gettysburg Address is featured in that. Two great authors tonight and two great books. Uh, I'm, let's talk about the books first. And Kevin Pereno is here with Lincoln in the World, The Making of a Statesman and the Dawn of American Power. It's from Random, published by Random House, 432 pages, and it's $26. Jared Peatman is here to discuss The Long Shadow of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, published by Southern Illinois University Press. It is 238 pages and costs $34.50. If at any time during the program tonight you want to send in a question, uh, you'll see in your interface there, you can send us an instant message. You can send us a question and the authors will answer it for you. Please include your name in your instant message, in your text message, because it does not automatically come through. If you wish to order a book, or two, or three, or four, it's the holidays, uh, Go ahead and do that. You can do that right online. Our authors will sign it for you and we will ship it out. That's what virtual book signing is. It's not a TV show. Uh, it is a book signing event and it's funded by you buying the books. And we thank you for that. We thank the author, the publishers for sending the authors here. Our authors, I want to introduce you. Kevin Pereno is a veteran foreign correspondent who has reported throughout the world. Uh, spent a decade at Newsweek um, and uh, working for another virtual book signing author, John Meacham, part of the time, uh, was a senior writer and bureau chief in the Middle East. Uh, he was a finalist for the Livingston Award for his foreign affairs reporting and was a part of the team that won the National Magazine Award for its coverage of the 2004 presidential campaign. Congratulations for that. Um, Kevin is a graduate of Northwestern University here in Evanston, uh, north of here in Evanston, 
uh, and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He lives in Connecticut with his wife and uh, children. And in a minute, I want to ask you a question here, uh, Kevin, but I want to introduce Jared Peatman first. Um, Jared is a 2002 graduate of Gettysburg College, has a master's degree from Virginia Tech and a PhD from Texas A&M, was awarded the 2009 Organization of American Historians and Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission Doctoral Fellow for his uh, uh, recently completed, recently published dissertation on the Gettysburg Address. He's uh, written Civil War articles, uh, written about Daniel Sickles in the shaping of President Lincoln's early perceptions of the Battle of Gettysburg. Since 2009, Jared has served as a lead historian for leadership events hosted by the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts and Partnership for Public Service. Goes to historical locations ranging from Gettysburg and Fort Necessity in Pennsylvania all, all the way to Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, and pretty soon Waterloo. That's right. And, uh, Jared lives in Northern Virginia with his wife and children. Welcome, <coughs> gentlemen. Thank you very much Thanks for, for coughing. Thanks my hand. very much for for yeah. joining us, Kevin. Let's start with you. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at Lincoln today in Jared's book too as a as a foreign policy man, but also as an international thinker, a guy who looked at the world in a particular way. How did this how did this idea, how did this topic come to you, and why did you want to write Lincoln in the World at this time? Sure. Um, um, I started it um, several years back when I was working, um, as you said, as a foreign correspondent mm -hmm. um, in the Middle East. And so I was reporting on the ground from places like Syria and Libya and Yemen, kind of doing this very much street-level kind of reporting. And um, I went through a period um, uh, several years back where I was really started to be interested in larger frameworks of American foreign policy to try to make sense of American foreign policy through some broader traditions of American foreign policy. And so um, I started reading and, um, and doing some research um, and, um, and this period um, just kind of sucked me in. So I came to it in a kind of backwards way. I came to it from the foreign policy side, but oh. um, uh, as I, I, I found myself wanting to read a book about Lincoln's foreign policy, um, um, and there, there wasn't one, or there hadn't been, um, in 70 years. And you, and you have the last one, um, the, the last, um, this isn't the last book about Lincoln's foreign policy, but this is the last holistic human account of Lincoln's role in foreign affairs. Um, Jay Monahan's Diplomat and Carpet Slippers. Diplomat and Carpet yeah. Slippers that, um, if I'm right, I think was published in 1945. Um, so coming up on 70 years, if my math is right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's before the Lincoln Papers were even um, available in uh, 1947. So there's an awful lot of water under the bridge. Um, right, you couldn't have seen a lot of the things that you... Exactly. Um, and um, it's a good book in some sense. I mean, I think he captures Lincoln as a foreign policy president, um, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's good in that sense. Um, but um, I think the interesting thing about Lincoln's foreign policy and the great Lincoln biographer James Randall, I think, captured it in, mm -hmm. in his account. He said, Lincoln didn't do as much in foreign policy as presidents like Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson or Franklin Roosevelt. But the things that Lincoln did do in foreign policy were really important. And so what I've tried to do is hone in on the, think, the things that Lincoln did do or, or things that tell us something about the character of a Lincolnian foreign policy mm -hmm. without saying Lincoln did every single thing. And, and so you mentioned that book. Well, I, I like that book um, and I enjoyed it. I think it tends to exaggerate Lincoln's role a little bit. Um, and I think when you do that, when you put Lincoln right at the center of his own foreign policy, you end up with kind of a hagiography because Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, as you know, was a, was a powerful and somewhat, you know, relatively competent Secretary of State. And <laughs> yeah. he did an awful lot. Lincoln delegated a lot to him. So that's why I've chosen this approach. Okay, good, good. Jared, you've been thinking about the Gettysburg Address for a long time. I have. Uh, now, we discussed something a little before we started. There have been several uh, books about the Gettysburg Address, and there are some others. Uh, Gary Wills has written about it, and Gabor Bora uh, has, has written about it, and more recently Martin Johnson has written about it. But this is not really one of those books, is it? The long shadow of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address kind of turns the coin over and looks <laughs> at another side of the Gettysburg Address. Can you tell us about The Long Shadow? Yeah, I think as many books as have been written about Lincoln, and specifically about the Gettysburg Address, uh, as, as there have been, there, there still was sort of a void. Um, 
most of the books that are out there, all the books that are out there, looked at one of two things. They looked at sort of the ideas that went into the speech, um, and, and I think Gary Wills, as you mentioned, did that at really a high level. You know, what was the, the political philosophy? What was the tradition that Lincoln was coming from? They looked at the words that went into the speech. A. E. Elmore did a really good job of that a few years ago, looking at uh, the Bible and the, the Book of Common Prayers influences. Martin Johnson's new book looks at the mechanical process of writing the speech um, mm -hmm. and and literally tries to figure out the timeline of when he actually wrote the thing. Mm -hmm. And they're all very interesting. There are another set of books, Gabor Boric, you mentioned, uh, Lewis Warren's from 1964. They look at what happened in Gettysburg, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the invitation, the crowds, and all those things. But I don't think anybody has looked at the, the long-term uses of the speech uh, until now. Uh, people usually talk about the responses to the speech in a few pages. You know, and there are a handful of accounts that everybody cites. The the Chicago seems how we're in Chicago. The Chicago Times is is one of the best ones. You know, they they really slam the president. Um, but sort of looking at the long term responses and uses to which the speech has been put is something that just hasn't been done before. So, for example, um, I would wager that that not many people know that the the current French Constitution is based on the Gettysburg Address. It says right at the bottom of the first page, the principle of this document is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It, perhaps even more surprising, uh, the Chinese, I guess we could call it a constitution of 1912, mm -hmm. uh, the, the document Sun Yat-sen authored called the Three People's Principles, is also based on the Gettysburg Address. Those are still the ruling principles that are adhered to in Taiwan today. So interesting that two foreign governments, uh, France and China, uh, initially China, actually had their governments based on the Gettysburg Address. In the 1950s and the 1960s, during the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement, and, and I'm glad to be here with Kevin today because I think it's uh, a nice second half of the story that Kevin Kevin tells. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, the U.S. government sees the Gettysburg Address as a foreign policy tool that it can use to try to sort of put out there, this is the best of us, this is the best of what our government, of our country stands for, all summed up in 272 words that we can distribute around the globe. Um, and so I think we'll see some examples of this a little bit later. Uh, but translations, comic books with the Gettysburg Address, disseminated around the world to try to, literally to try to win the Cold War in the 1960s. Yeah. There's, there's uh, uh, a graphic novel out right now. A guy named John Hennessy has written a fine graphic novel that, that really looks at the Gettysburg Address. Uh, but the, um, uh, let's go to write, uh, let's go to write the moment the Gettysburg Address ended. Let's start with, Lincoln sitting down. Uh, how, how did America receive and perceive the address immediately after he gave it? I mean, famously, he didn't think it went over very well. Did they applaud? Didn't they applaud? But more importantly, what did the nation know about it and how did they learn about it? That's a great question. Um, in, in my book, in my research, I looked at four cities and mm -hmm. I looked at their early responses in 1863 before moving on to the later period. So I looked at Gettysburg, not surprisingly, and in Gettysburg, they were pretty complimentary of the speech. Uh, you know, Lincoln had blessed their town with a visit. You know, they had nice things to say. They'd come into touch with greatness. And by and large, they have very positive things to say. Sort of surprising, you know, the Democratic uh, newspaper in Gettysburg has, was typically really anti-Lincoln. But even they held off with the barbs for once after the Gettysburg Address. Um, New York, it's a little different because in New York, which is incredibly important for national news reporting. What comes out of New York will dominate pretty much everything throughout the, the North at that time. In New York, it's much more mixed. The interesting thing in my mind is that in New York, they find other speeches to be of more, uh, demand more attention in 1863. So William Seward um, has said some things that they're not thrilled about. Edward Everett has said some things in his speech that they're not thrilled about. Mm -hmm. And they find those things to be of more immediate a comment than what Abraham Lincoln had to say. You know, this old rivalry between Boston and New York goes back a long time, mm -hmm. and most of the New York papers spend the, the bulk of their speech criticizing Edward Everett. They say that he's from boasting Massachusetts, uh, and they're <laughs> pointing out that in his speech, Edward Everett had really privileged the role of Massachusetts men in the battle and had, had downplayed the role of New Yorkers in the battle. So right early on, you know, you start to, you see it's really regional. I think the most interesting is in Richmond, and in Richmond, I argue, the, the five daily newspapers in Richmond will censor the Gettysburg Address, and there's a very simple reason why. If you look at that first line, Lincoln has invoked mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence. He said, all men are created equal. Now, if you live in the Confederate South and you're a Confederate newspaper editor, you can't agree with that. But at the same time, 
how do you shoot it down? Those words were written by Thomas Jefferson, who's a Virginian. <laughs> so Lincoln is, I don't know if he did it intentionally or not, but Lincoln has created this interesting little trap. If you go to London, the, the other place I looked, that same sort of trap applies because in doing that, he cited the Declaration of Independence from them. So he's kind of determined at the same time his speech is a little tough for them to deal with. So, Kevin, I enjoyed in your book you talked about um, some of the things that William Seward said early on, and, and you mentioned Edward Everett as well, some of their comments about embroiling um, perhaps Great Britain in a war to try to bring the two sections of the country back together. And for that reason, the, the London papers will really talk about both Seward and Everett, uh, and they'll remind people of uh, these gentlemen's past and they'll focus on their speeches as well mm -hmm. so it's interesting the words are before the people throughout the country throughout the world but there's not a lot of reaction in the short term they they typically find other speeches to be uh, more more appropriate to comment on